Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess and today we're doing something really cool. We've actually been working on it this weekend. Um, I have been very engaged and therefore not shooting video. Last time we hosted one of these classes, I was hosting and <laughs> not learning as much and my and I discussed having hand hewn farm back out and to to butcher some of our hogs and though we did end up opening some spaces to some local friends we really wanted to make sure that we were fully engaged so that's what we've been doing um, I wanted to kind of put a preface on this we're homesteaders it's not a surprise you guys know that we raise our own meat uh, because our our channel has been so garden uh, centric I haven't always discussed that in depth um, about like meat production and stuff and though I will never uh, do any like public information that like shows butchering step by step um, just because that there are so many people that are doing that content well I don't feel like I need to do that um, I am going to be showing some of these processes with the disclaimer you're never going to accidentally like stumble upon this and be like whoa I was just trying to learn garden stuff um, but in our opinion and I've shared this for years um, I feel like as meat eaters the responsible thing for us to do is raise our own meat so we make sure that it is ethically taken care of that it's honored and respected um, and this is for us how we take responsibility for our appetites so today we are actually working on curing some hogs we have spent the last two days um, we butchered them quartered them obviously you have to let those hang for a certain period of time before you process them it's about a like overnight uh, before you start processing them and that's what we're working on right now we're in day three of this workshop with Han Hewn Farm and we are working on salt curing. And though this has been one of those weeks where I know I'm not teaching a lot of stuff, um, I'm showing you what we're learning in the hopes that someday I will be in a place of confident application where I feel like I can teach it. Ezra, can I have my bubble? You busted your bubble? Well yeah. go get another one and show me. Oh that's cool Toby. <laughs> That's super cool, actually. Through the basic principles and ideas behind curing, I'm going to show you how to do one and how we do it. And then we're all going to work together and you'll get plenty of practice curing different things because we're going to cure jowls, bellies, the shoulder muscle, which we called the copa yesterday, prosciutto, lardo, loin sections, which are called lonza in Italian. But right now, I'm going to bore you to death with a bunch of sciencey stuff so that you guys hopefully let some of this information soak in and then while we're doing it you're probably going to come up with more questions and while you're doing it we'll answer some of those when doug and i talk about curing what we are usually referring to is adding salt to uh, a protein of some sort in enough of a quantity that the bacteria that rots meat can't rot it anymore because the salt gets bound with the water and that water isn't accessible for the bacteria to use to proliferate and make meat rot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go get it. Okay. Yeah, it's in this little camp. Ben, are you cutting that? Here, you hold it up. Okay. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Where's the black peppers? Do you Very have nice. more Yo, black you pepper? Really sharp. Thank you. It is really sharp. Be careful. It was in the middle in front of you. You're hogging yeah. the pepper. Yeah, my two, go ahead and slide it down. Let's get the skin right here. Hug. Yeah. My, no, one second. There we go. Well, let's yard. see. Yeah, let's I got it. You got it? Oh, we got to make sure we're not sawing it because we don't want to tear up so the meat. Skin. Like, let's go back forward. There we go. Let's try to get the sharp part on the leg. Yeah, it's just skin. Let's try to make it in the middle. Well done, sir. So later in this video, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about breeds and what we're doing with our breeding for raising hogs for meat here on our farm. So I want to show you something about mangalitsas. We've been breeding and raising mangalitsas on our farm for three and a half years now. It's when we first got our original breeding stock. And mangalitsas are lard pigs. Um, they have a really thick fat cap. Uh, they have more fat throughout their body than other pigs. And they have really good quality meat. However, the pigs that we butchered this weekend which we were expecting this so it's not a shock to us and it's not an upset to us but they were really fat um having been out on the pond they were just huge and with that being the case um well let me just show you what this looks like so i want you to look at these areas of this hog that this is the belly so this is where you would be making like your bacon 
and just look how thick the fat cap is on here. So on our pork chops, we had like four or five inches of fat. Obviously, we cut a lot of that off. And on this belly, we decided to make pancetta instead of bacon because this can be used more as like a cooking oil. So it's not a bad thing if it's what you're expecting, but I really did want to shine light on this and further discuss this breed. Okay, all the way to the table. Remember, sometimes you have to use your hand to pull this away as you're cutting. Okay. Now over here we have a pot of stock that simmered all night so uh, we'll strain this out and I'll actually be canning that uh, pressure canning that on the stove so that's kind of like finishing off here towards the end um, and I'm gonna get that going we've been pulling out all the jars so they're actually leaving tomorrow and I'll still be working on preserving all of this stuff probably for at least a few days afterwards getting just like steadily doing a lot of canning so as you can see from those massive fat caps on this mangalitsa um, we knew this was gonna be a really fatty pig and it's it's fine that it is um, we're saving a lot of lard that we'll use for cooking but um, it's not ideal if you're trying to like get the most bang for your buck and raising your own meat now the meat quality is fantastic and for charcuterie which is what we're doing with a lot of this is salt curing it's also very good uh, but it's not it's not what we want necessarily moving forward um, and I'll I'll show you guys our remedy to that like our plan but first uh, we actually just pulled the third hog we did three hogs this weekend we just pulled the third one out of the cooler and we hit it, we're beginning to break it down so I'm gonna take you guys over there and show you what that looks like and tell you what we're doing with it I had to run inside and get a little coffee for a coffee break because it's been a long couple of days. After very carefully cutting the first couple of pigs for curing and the like, this one's actually getting cubed for sausage and something called riette. Here we're saving all the lard to render and save as cooking oil. But as you can see on this hog, um, there is a lot of fat, but the meat itself is really beautiful and high quality. This is kind of all hands on deck because we're getting towards the end. And like I said, this is all going to be ground or riette anyway, so it doesn't have to be perfect. What do you think? I think that this is a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. All right, we're going to go down now to the pig yard, and I'm going to talk to you guys about our plans moving forward. I'm doing a lot of voiceover in this video because everybody's working. I don't want to make them turn their music off, but I also don't want to get slapped on the wrist by the copyright police. So let's go down here and talk about our future plans for raising pigs and why the breed really matters. Okay, check it out. The high tunnels are progressing. Hey, pigs. Hey, pigs. So I really wanted to make this video today about while we're, we're butchering these mangalitsa pigs and kind of talk about this so the expectations are right. So I've showed you that we are, are parting out these pigs. Uh, you know, we've, we've put several cuts into vacuum bags and we're doing a method called equilibrium curing which is where you weigh the meat and then you add two percent salt and whatever seasonings you're doing and then you vacuum pack it and i'm gonna put some information down for hand hewn because they're brilliant they understand this stuff and i'm so thankful to have them teaching us i am not the teacher of this i am the student of this someday i'll be able to share my knowledge with you but i'm not comfortable doing that until i have some experience personally but um, we've got our EQ cures in the fridge. Uh, we cut up a lot of fresh cuts. That's like some pork chops, some loin. Um, didn't do just a ton of that. We did like the tenderloins, the loins, uh, pork chops. Um, we are curing some legs for prosciutto. All of that stuff, that's all packed away. And now this last hog that we're cutting up, we're turning into a, something called riette, which is like a it's kind of like a potted meat essentially kind of a pate and it is a, it is delicious and wonderful um and we're making so much of it because we wanted to be able to share we so enjoyed it last time but we didn't have a whole lot and so we we're like would it be interesting since we needed to go ahead 
and process some hogs to get them off of this field and we're going to be moving the pigs that are over here off so we can start planting this orchard and we we were like, well, let's go make, go ahead and make a whole pig and re-et, that way we can share with people. That's not really the point of this video. What really, I wanted to talk about the manga breed and kind of what we're doing for the future of our farm and raising meat. Mangalitsas, these pigs here are mangalitsas. They are a heritage breed of pork that are most known by their curly coats. Hey, piggies. Uh, as you can see, they have curly hair, and we have been breeding these for the last handful of years now. And when we processed these pigs this weekend, we knew exactly what to expect. We knew that we were going to be seeing like really thick, four or five inch fat caps. Um, we knew we were not going to have a really like large amount they're not meaty they're fatty they're lard pigs same thing with cooney coonies and these types of pigs namely mangalitsas and cooney coonies have gotten hugely popular over the last handful of years mangalitsas were nearly extinct in the 90s they have been brought out of obscurity they're still pretty rare i mean like people pull in here regularly and go i've never seen a pig that looks like that before they're not kept commercially if you look at mangalitsas you'll see the kobe beef of pork i mean they, they their meat quality is amazing i mean it, it really is and they're cool pigs they don't get huge um now they're still big don't get me wrong i mean like they can be 400 pounds but we've had we had some sows once that were like a heritage old spot or dirk or something like that that were nearly 800 pounds so they don't get as big as other heritage breeds but they're lard pigs and i think this is so important to stress and it's why i really like i've not shown much processing on this channel but i've i wanted to show you guys what that looks like because if you were raising this hog out they grow slower the hogs that we are processing now are over two years old which is that's old for a feeder pig and when they when they put weight on a lot of it is fat now depending on goals that might not be a problem for you fat is one of those things that like when you're growing your food it can be a problem sourcing that uh, we have butter from our cows obviously whenever you take a gallon of milk and you maybe have like less than a quarter of that is cream and then you go ahead and process that into butter you're talking about ounces of butter out of every gallon of milk i mean the the fat of something is not the majority so to be able to raise an animal that provides copious amounts of fat which can be used like the leaf lard can be used in baking you can fry in it you can whip lard and make body products out of it you can use it for your skin and so to be able to raise raise lard is not a bad thing as long as that's your expectation but I've talked to a handful of people now who got into the ideas of mangalitsas because they heard about the quality of meat and then they got the belly of that animal and they were so excited about the bacon and they realized that when they cooked that bacon so much of it was fat they were going to have very 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 little actual edible meat left we actually did not even cure any of these bellies for bacon uh, we processed them all as pancetta which we are going to basically use as a seasoning so basically i'll take that and keep in mind the value of it is the oil so i can put some pancetta in a pan and then brown my onions in that fat or brown whatever maybe like cook some chicken in it or f throw some vegetables in it my i'm using it as a seasoning and an oil rather than expecting a sub substantial amount of meat from it and i actually didn't really fully grasp this about mangalitsas when I first got into them. Um, I, like many people, was just like, wow, these are such cool animals. I like how neat they are, like how unique they are. But I didn't really fully understand in my mind, oh, I want a lard pig. I'm going to use the fat. It's a lot. It's a lot of fat. And the fat to meat ratio may be disappointing. So what we're doing moving forward we actually got this old spot from our friends uh, vw family farm ben and andrea vincent in arkansas and we also got another old spot now this guy is um he's just a feeder he's he can't be bred but this pig is significantly younger than these pigs 
and he's as big as them. And though we isolated him because he wasn't gaining weight super fast because the bigger pigs were bullying him when he was smaller, being isolated, he has converted that feed to weight gain fast. And when we process this pig, he won't have five inches of fat on him. Now, if my goal was to fill the freezer, or fill the fridge with lard, that would be disappointing. But if I want pork chops or bacon, this pig is going to be of much higher value to me. Now, when our last breed of full bred mangas was born, um, I sold a couple of them. I kept these two um they're barrows now so they have been they're males that have been cut so these two are feeders and then this male was born and he was just a really pretty mangalitsa he was very well conformed and so i kept him intact so this is a boar means he can breed when we when we processed our first mangalitsa i realized this can't be the only pork we raise to feed a family with five hungry boys. Um, I need something that is more substantial and meatier than this. Now, I like the lard. I like the flavor. I appreciate mangalitsas for the value in charcuterie. They're fantastic pigs for curing and charcuterie. The fat's not really a negative there. It's a, it can be a positive thing. But I'm not putting legs of prosciutto up you know, in a food security thing. That's, that's a luxury. That's when I talk about thriving and not just surviving, doing things like charcuterie for me, yes, there's, there's a benefit. It doesn't require power. Um, you know, you could, you're basically making meat that's shelf stable. Um, but that's not why we're doing that. We're doing that because it's a luxury item. We're doing that because we love food. We're doing that because it's really cool to be able to create something that you can't even buy a comparable product at the store. The quality is just completely, um, just in a completely different level. We did decide that we could not justify continuing with pu purebred mangalitsas only. I could see where there would be value in continuing to raise mangalitsas if you wanted to carve out like a niche. But what we've decided to do, and while we got this old spot breeder, and while we kept that manga boar right there, is that we're actually planning on crossing those. And I'm looking to get another old spot breeder and an old spot boar. So I'd like to have two sows, and then a mangalitsa boar and an old spot boar. And that way I can have some full blood old spots, which is just such a fast growing heritage, that's gonna be higher meat content and less lard for things like pork chops and loins and roasts and, and Boston butts and picnic roasts and all of that stuff, bacon. We'll raise them for that. And then I can cross with the manga and hopefully still get some of that lard content, but tone it down a little bit so we can use those for charcuterie. But then if we want, it's just gonna be a little bit more versatile. So that's why I wanted to kind of show you guys. I've, I've talked about this some in a video before. We've talked about um, why we're keeping that boar. We've talked about why we have this old spot. I think I've mentioned the fact that I was looking for breeding stock and I, I ended up finding some, I think. I don't have a deposit down on anything, but I think I've got some that I think is gonna end up working out. But all of that said, when we have these hogs on the table and we're parting them up, I feel like people hear lard pig and they see people raising mangas and cooney coonies and they hear the value of those and if you know what you're getting into it's fine you know like if you if you are expecting that if you are valuing the lard if you have other sources of meat but for a lot of people who are getting into homesteading for the very first time and they're turning on YouTube and they're watching people like me and they're saying, oh, they raise mangalitsas, I bet that's the best. I should do that too. I really want you to know, I raised them for this specific purpose and if you are just looking for a versatile pig to throw your kitchen scraps to and to feed out with good quality feed to have a source of meat, that would not be my first choice. And it's kind of like raising some of the heirloom vegetables that I grow. It might not be the number one choice for production, but that might, production might not be your number one priority. Um, maybe it is for something 
beautiful or unique or interesting or tasty and, and don't get me wrong we didn't get as much meat as we would have had we butchered um, a pure old spot of the same age we definitely did not but the meat we got is going to be exceptional in quality um, and what we're doing with it I'm glad they're mangas for what we're doing with it but my hope is to kind of marry that um, extra, the extra qualities that we're talking about, those, those really neat things and how delicious they are. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping to marry that with a little bit of practicality by breeding against the old spot and maybe getting a multi-purpose hybrid that, that is not gonna fill my freezer up with fat. So I'm pulling some time here off this plant we have a recipe that we're doing inside for this riette, and it requires a lot of time. Um, and we actually, I had dried a bunch from my home in Arkansas where I had like a carpet of time, but I'm wishing I had that big old thyme plant now because we need more. We've just begun to render the lard. Uh, here is the leaf lard. I'll show you a jar that's already dried. As you can see, it's nice and white. This is going to be really great for cooking and even baking because the leaf lard is the most neutral. What is this for, the riette? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's so it keeps it from um, falling apart into layers. Nice. It's like putting a toothpick through it. So when it boils over at 9 o'clock tonight. <laughs> So as you can see here, we have some pretty thick fat, but the fat is important for Riet. So this is not something that you have to process a, cook, a pig to make. Um, you can actually buy like a shoulder and uh, some a belly, a pork belly and a shoulder and get the different parts and make Riet. And we have these two um, roaster ovens that we're going to get going now, but we are actually taking a lot more of this meat that's chunked, uh, the fat that's chunked and we're going to it, some of it's probably going to go ahead and go into the freezer and then we'll do other batches of this later because it, it takes quite a while for this to cook all right everybody's actually gone home it's a lot quieter in my house now and i'm going to show you just a glimpse in my back fridge right now so here are the um equilibrium cures that i told you about now a lot of these are back here um, there's more out in the fridge that we have we have a shed that we call our meat shed um, and these are different recipes so like this is this is Alonza um, this has curry powder on it um, here's pancetta that has rosemary leaves as you can tell we did the whole belly and one of the things that's now at the top of our list Maya is gonna have our guys continuing on the high tunnels and he is going to bump up to the top of the list getting our cold smokehouse built because we're going to be pulling those cures out of the fridge and then like a couple weeks and start cold smoking most of them some of them dry age some of them will just hang this is another one of those things i know this week has been a lot of what we're learning and of course you guys watch it and the first thing that that we hear is well how do we do that and the answer is I can't really tell you yet like I'm figuring it out but my hope is um, to become a resource for that eventually but I have to become someone who knows what I'm talking about before I try to be someone who teaches it uh, this to us is one of the big things that we really wanted to do in homesteading is we wanted to be able to experience things that we couldn't necessarily experience at the store we wanted to create something that was really special and in 2018, we actually met Doug and Andy at Homesteaders of America. Um, they were sampling out prosciutto. Um, Maya took one taste of that, and we bought our first pigs a few, um, a few weeks later, which were the breeding stock for the mangalitsas that we are now butchering. So it's been a long process, you know, like four years in the making. Um, of course, we have we have processed one manga before uh, last year around February. And it's pretty awesome to get to this point and also to be developing our own preferences, how that we know how we want to move forward. So thank you guys for hanging out with us today. Uh, I'll put a link down to Han Hoon down below. You can check them out for more resources. I bless you. Until next time.